but I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses when I was 14 in 1954. And in 1982, my husband and I were invited to the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. actually as a researcher on Jehovah's Witnesses proclaimers of God's kingdom. <music> Leaving the group 43 years later in 1998 was not easy. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Glad you're here. It's nice to be able to be on a live stream again. Today we have our special guest and when we bring him here on very shortly. We look forward to the special guest, like all our guests, um, very special. Barbara is our guest today. And how are you today, Barbara? Just fine, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Seven o'clock. In your neck of the woods, what part of the United States of America do you come from? Or are you living, I should say? In the south, in Tennessee. Tennessee. Actually. And it's, I live uh, south central Tennessee by car, an hour from Huntsville, Alabama. So I'm really in the south. Does it snow there? Oh, we had a little dusting this morning. Last year we had none. Our weather is uh, changeable. It can be uh, uh, cold, uh, and the next day it's 40, 50, and that's the way it is all winter. That's what we like about it. <laughs> Did you build a snowman at all this year? <laughs> uh, in the, all the years that I've been here, it's only a few times that we had enough snow to do anything with. And then two days later or a day later, it's gone. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I can't remember the last time I built a snowman here. <laughs> My daughter would have been six. We were, in a, we were living in a place called Pahiatua. We actually got snow that year. But, yeah, that was so long ago. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I'm from up. New York. I was born and raised in Long Island, and so I remember snow well. And then when I was at Bethel, uh, the first year we were there, they had a huge snowstorm, and so that was my reintroduction into uh, snow. Snow. Yeah. Well, you, you can have the snow. I'm quite happy we don't get too much of it, <laughs> so, especially here where I live in New Zealand. So. Okay, so tell us a little bit about yourself. When did you first become a Jehovah's Witness? I was baptized in 1954 when I was 14. And uh, I was at a girlfriend's house doing homework with her when I was uh, 13. And yeah. a, a witness called back to talk to her mother. And she left a book with her mother. But the woman didn't want to go to the door. But I, um, and, and the, my girlfriend didn't want to go to the doors. But they wanted to get rid of her, but they didn't want to talk to her. So I volunteered 
And she was so interesting. She didn't think of me as a kid. She just began to talk to me. I was Catholic and she was an ex-Catholic. So we had that in common. So she started talking to me about that. And I was so fascinated by what she had to say that I asked her to come to uh, where I live, talk to my mother. And she did, she came that evening and, and we arranged for another call. My mother had been taking the Watchtower and Awake from her for quite a while, but she never read it. She just was nice. And <laughs> my mother threw him away. So when she saw the woman, she recognized her. So that was uh, okay. You know, it was like meeting a stranger. Mm. So, uh, within, um, oh, I'd say uh, six, seven months, uh, we were both baptized. So time went along. What were some of the things that you did before? Because uh, Joe's your husband. Have I got that right? Joe, yes. Uh -huh. okay. So what were some of the things that led up to you meeting Joe and getting married? Uh, my parents moved to Miami in, in um, 1956. Mm -hmm. I was 16. And we just, mother and I, and my brother, I had an older brother, and we continued with the witnesses in Miami. So then after school, I went, I wanted to go where the need was great. And so there were two other girls in Miami that also wanted to do that. So we asked for an assignment, and this, and we were assigned to uh, uh, Mississippi, Columbus, Mississippi. There was a, a University of Alabama there. And we found it very difficult to find any work because uh, the young people who were at college, they were working in all part-time jobs. So we lasted about three months. It was a very small congregation over the border in, in uh, Alabama. And uh, so we couldn't stay because we couldn't make any any money. And rather than go back to Miami, we had heard that they were looking for people to work at the headquarters just to volunteer in the rooming work because the 1958 convention was coming up. So we determined we had $50 between us. And so, but, so we went back to, we went to my congregation that I had left. And uh, I called someone I knew and uh, agreed to put us up until we could find our own place. And that's uh, what I did. And we, uh, two of us worked at the headquarters. The other uh, gal, she was a little older than we were and she got herself a job right away full time. So the, it was uh, very nice, very interesting at headquarters. And I was going back to my old congregation in Long Island that I had left two or three years before. We, um, we were really enjoying ourselves. And there was a woman who moved into the congregation from Dallas, Texas, the year that I was gone. So she, I didn't realize it, but she was uh, uh, matching me up for, with her son or for her son <laughs> and she had a get together at her house and she asked us to come and for some reason it was about that time i began to suspect that uh, she had a son she never really talked about it but the, and the congregation didn't know her well but there was just some things about this that I wondered about. And why would you, and she said she was having some Bethelites out to her house. And that was strange because here she just moved in. And how did she know Bethelites? So I put two and two together and asked around and found that she did have a son. So she was actually uh, having a, uh, uh, she was having dreams of putting me with her son and we were going into circuit work and all that kind of things. And it was, so we went to the party and uh, there were a number of uh, girls and guys. There were, he, my, my husband now at that time had the car and he drove from Bethel to, in Brooklyn to Long Island. And there were six of them in the car. So, 
there were about that many girls at the house, three of us and three more. So uh, anyway, I was uh, sitting near uh, the uh, entrance into the kitchen. We were in the living room sitting around mm -hmm. talking and I heard the back door, it was some spring and she had the, the main door open and I heard the screen door slam. And so I uh, next thing I heard was this gal saying to her son, it's a blonde in the living room. It's a blonde. And he said, Mother, you know, I don't want to meet any blondes. He said, I, I have signed up for Bethel for three years, and I have another few years to go. And he said, I'm not interested. Anyway, I came in the room. We danced back then. It wasn't a, a um, anathema to dance, and we ballroom dance actually. It was a non unusual. And I studied with a woman before I left Long Island. I met her door to door, and uh, she studied with uh, me. And she was a, a ballroom teacher, uh -huh, ballroom dancing teacher. And so she taught me. And so when uh, my husband now, he knew how to ballroom dance. His sister taught him when they lived in Dallas. So he asked the girls in the room and he wanted, didn't want to talk to me because he knew what mother said. So <laughs> he, he asked each girl, they put on uh, records. Those were the days we had records. So he put on a record. Somebody put a record. I had tango music on. And so he asked each girl to, if they tangoed, and they said no. And when he got to me, he said, do you tango? And I said, yes. And so we danced. And that morning, I had purchased a new pair of shoes. And I had a buckle on, uh, on the, each shoe in the front. And when he did the sidestep overstep, his feet hit that buckle and broke my shoe. I mean, and, and so, um, so anyway, since that time, we've been tangoing ever since, and he's been buying all my shoes ever since. So just I to make up for that buckle, eh? That's right. So anyway, he was at Bethel, and I would go in uh, every day, uh, uh, weekdays, and I also work part time. I, uh, I work at a life insurance company part time. So I would see him there. And then one day he called me up and invited me to a get together in Bethel that some of the guys were having. And so we three went and that was the beginning. And then by the time the convention rolled around in 1958 at the Yankee Stadium in the Polo Grounds, uh, we were engaged. And so he, he still had a year and a half to go at Bethel. Uh, and so uh, when he was, uh, fulfilled his agreement my i was i went to my back to where my parents were mm -hmm. and tried to put together uh a little bit of money he had 30 dollars to his name and so i had less i tell you and so anyway uh we that's when we where we started and we started pioneering right away and we our territory was palm beach Actually, that was a very fascinating place to go door to door. All the multimillionaires, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, two years later, uh, we were as uh, getting ready to take an assignment, and Montgomery, Alabama, was where the society was going to send us, and they were getting us ready to go on the circuit work in the future. So, but I found out I was pregnant, and and uh, our son was born in nineteen sixty one. And we always told him, uh, you know, one of these days you're going to go to Bethel. So when he was 19 years old, he did. And he, he was in Bethel 16 years. That's a capsule. Of, uh, he encapsulated uh, many, many years. So we've been yeah. very active, very, very active. We studied with many, many people in West Palm Beach. It was a very transient area. My parents had moved from Miami to West Palm Beach. And so when I came back from New York, it was to West Palm Beach. And, and it was, uh, I found it very easy to study the Bible. We studied with uh, 
uh, people who were running away from home, <laughs> they were running to West Palm Beach because it was warm, and they they could sleep outside. I mean, if they were really, it was that's the kind of area it was back in those years. A very nice area, but people who you didn't need a lot of money to live there. And uh, we we studied with um, hippies, and um, my husband. Men, uh, actually married uh, one of them to uh, one of the young women in the congregation and um, and that man is out of the witnesses for many years and uh, he's a friend of ours and he, to the at this point in our life so uh, he, and and someone else called me a few months ago and she saw me on a TV program Mm -hmm. Saja called me, and she, uh, her parents both were hippies, and uh, we went to the same congregation. Her father has been an elder for years, and she's out of the organization, but her parents are still in. So that was nice to just to, mm -hmm. to talk to her. So she said she hadn't. Uh, she always heard about me, uh, but she saw me on the program, and she took took the uh, opportunity to get a hold of me. So my life has been extremely interesting as a Jehovah's Witness. We've traveled a lot, done a lot, and um, still still I'm doing a lot, which all witnesses, uh, uh, if they want to, they can have a, a very interesting life. And even uh, those who leave it, it's not the end of the world. It's the beginning of a whole new adventure. So your son went into Bethel. He was there for 16 years. Yes. Um, I believe you and Joe ended up in Bethel as well? Yes. Uh, this, uh, he was there for a year, and uh, we went there to visit him. Um, so we were we stayed at Bethel because they could make the arrangements. If you back then, you could have uh, relatives stay at Bethel. Mm -hmm. So we were leaving Saturday morning and uh, having breakfast at Bethel, and my husband saw the man that he worked uh, under years before in nineteen fifty six. My husband was assigned to the press room. And so he saw this man and he went over and introduced himself and the fellow had recognized my husband from all those years because they had some interesting stories that he remembered that the guys uh, were involved in back those years. So, so he asked my husband uh, what he, no, my husband said, uh, you don't you don't need any old people around here. So this, this was 82. And uh, and the fellow asked, well, what do you do? And my husband said, well, I'm a plumber. And he said, well, just hold on. So he said he left and his wife was talking to me. And he just just told Joe to just wait a minute. He said, I'm going to make some calls. So he called the service department and asked about Joe's record as a, a JW. And he found out that Joe was uh, had pioneered for many years while we were married and that uh, he was, uh, first of all, a congregation servant for years and then elder for years. So when he came back, that see, he already checked, he, he vetted him. And then he said, um, would you be interested in to come into Bethel? And my, my husband said that Joe said, "Well, yeah, it could be." <laughs> and um, so he said, "Well, I'm going to make arrangements for you to talk to Max Larson, who was the the man that was over the factories. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you'll just hang in there, I'll have you talk to him, and I'll also have you talk to." Don Underwood, who was the man who was over the uh, worldwide um, construction work. So we did meet with them and they told us to um, 
make arrangements to come back. I mean, we were accepted immediately, which should have told us something that they were desperate, right? <laughs> because that's not the way Bethel works, you know. <laughs> but he, Joe had a good recommendation from years before and all the years he was very active. So uh, within a month we were back. In fact, it ruined our vacation because on the way home, we had to drive all the way home and, and think about, oh my, how are we going to do this? How are we going to change our whole life? And we had just mm. purchased property in Tennessee where the house I live in now, we purchased that. And uh, we were uh, working on the house because it needed uh, remodeling because we were, we were, we had no money back in those years. We, everything we had was always connected with putting more service in and more service in. So we had a mobile home at one point in Florida and then, we came here. We would have rented a, a house here, but very few houses were available to rent because this is an area that uh, has a um, government, a lot of government um, organizations. Uh, they here they um, and they still do. Uh, since 1950, they tested uh, our. Uh, uh, airplane engines because they have a wind tunnel here it's the only wind tunnel in the whole world at one point oh, there so you had engineers and uh extremely talented people who are here and they'd come in from california from boeing or from other areas where they were working on space stuff and so they come in and rent a house. And so that's why there were so few places to rent. Mm -hmm. And this place was up for sale and we knew witnesses here. So, um, but when we first came from, from uh, Florida up here, we came for uh, a wedding and uh, loved it. And uh, the people that invited us um, to visit, they were um, new people in West Palm Beach. And so we knew them through that, that arrangement. And it was a, it's a delightful place to live. But we first came and we moved in the mountains in Tennessee because they needed a congregation. And uh, we, uh, with us, Dayton, Tennessee is where the famous or infamous Scopes trial was. And uh, we went to that congregation and then we helped build the congregation in an, another area and so we were there two years it was the mountains were too much for uh, for me and i couldn't go out at, during the day making return visits by myself or because it was uh, uh just too treacherous and the weather was a problem it was very very icy in the winter so we knew the people over in this part of uh, tennessee and and uh they, and and there was a job opening for a plumber, and so that's how we got over here. But we had bought this house, so here we are. We go to Bethel, and we were redoing this house, and we figured, well, how in the world are we going to do all this? But my parents, they moved into our house, and so with eleven almost eleven years we were gone, they were here, and they also had a, a built a home on this property, and. It, it worked out very well. So. well that's good. so you got to Bethel. Your husband started doing plumbing. And my what, husband, were you, what, were you do, what were you doing? You were sitting there cooking? Well, and no, husband, and... Yeah. No, I came into Bethel as excess baggage. Oh, okay. <laughs> they didn't need me. They needed him. So uh, uh, women my age, I was 42. And women my age were automatically put in tape duplicating. That's when years ago they used to have tapes, Bible tapes, and you could even uh -huh. read the Bible or some a fellow read the Bible. So they put us all in to in that, and it was a very uh, much a factory situation. But when I went in, and they asked us to fill out a card on our, our health, I mentioned that I. I was very highly allergic to uh, industrial chemicals. And wouldn't you know it, nobody read the card and they put me in with industrial chemicals. So I couldn't stay there, I got sick. Mm. And um, and then they, when they realized that, that see, under those circumstances, they would have said go home. But 
they wanted my husband. Mm -hmm. And so they transferred me into shipping and I and a few other um, people, some of the very ancient Bethelites like that knew Russell at the time <laughs> in the eighties, they were working in tape in, in um, shipping and we packed uh, special orders. So it was a nice job and, and I enjoyed it and got to know some of the very elderly people that rubbed shoulders with Rutherford and, you know, so that was so interesting to me. And uh, my husband, he does more than just plumbing. He, he's a builder. He could build a house. Yeah. And so he knew all aspects of construction. And that's what they wanted. But they wanted him to train some of the young people to be plumbers, too. And they wanted an older man. And they also were very happy that we had a son in Bethel. They wanted families, a few family people, because you had all three. I, I'm trying to think back. Three quarters of the Bethel family were young men brought in to work in the factories. Mm -hmm. So they needed leadership and help and training. And so Don Underwood, who was over the worldwide construction work, he had five children. They were all grown, but he... He, so he was a family man, and they, they felt that the, that would be a, a modifying force with the young uh, men who tended to be a little bit screwy. You know, they first time they're away from home and they're in New York City. I mean, that was some adventure. They were getting themselves in hot water. <laughs> so, so it was a very nice uh, opportunity. And I was there in in the um, that department for almost six, seven months, mm -hmm. I already had uh, some knowledge of uh, data entry and my background was in accounting. So uh, I, they moved me into, oh, I knew because of my background of accounting, I knew how to um, use the numbers on an adding machine without looking um, just, okay. yep. you know and so what i was doing is putting in the literature orders from the congregations across the united states and you they all have numbers everything you ever bought through the society has a number not a name and so they send it in and uh, i and about nine other people and the, there were um two governing body wives in that department and also somebody by the name of arthur worsley who became a dear friend of ours who uh, knew who worked at headquarters and in the circuit work uh, for years and he um was quite old and he was in that little department and that's what he would check our work and so so would some of the other older folk and so we would sit and i found it very easy to just uh take these literature orders i could talk to the people in the room and do my let me see because that's what you get used to doing so i learned a lot of, from these people their backgrounds i worked with lucille henschel that's henschel's wife and um Brother Barr's wife, and I'm calling him by witness terms here, and uh, some of the others that were in very, oh, uh, Schroeder, Schroeder's wife, mm -hmm. uh, other men who uh, were very influential at Bethel in the service department, th their wives were there. So it was, their experiences were interesting, and I sort of really got to know peers rather than being, you know, at Bethel, they call you when you knew your new boy or, you know, because it was a man, a new girl. And we weren't, we had a history with my husband being there before. And uh, he picked up when he, co he, he, he comes into Bethel and there are a number of men that work with him in the press room years and years before. Our son is 20 then. And so like 22 years before, the so handful of men, or two handfuls, are now running the organization. 
So he has a back room with him. The banker of Bethel was in the press room with my husband. I mean, th it was a very nice uh, experience. And being a New Yorker, for me, it was not intimidating to be in the city. Uh, it was very fine. And I can't, uh, I mean, there were times where you had problems. It, it were 4,000 people in the complex that were at Bethel, 4,000. Wow. And so you, you had to learn how to get along with people. If you didn't know, you had to learn. <laughs> and um, so because of the pioneering uh, over the years, we got a, a room with a bathroom. If you hadn't pioneered, you got a room with a bathroom down the hall. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, that's the boys usually had the boys' floor, young men's floor. If they didn't ever pioneer, um, that's the way they lived. Our son did, you know. He and my, our son, when he went to Bethel six months later, a young man from this area who became quite active, he put in for Bethel and he became my son's roommate. So. It was really nice. It was like the four of us, we went to the same congregation in um, the Prospect Park. It's a very beautiful park in Brooklyn and the P Prospect Park congregation right near there. So it was an adventure and we had a lot of experiences. So from, so I stayed in, um, in that department, uh, invoicing it was called which belonged to under the auspices of the shipping department, which there were about 200 people under shipping. Mm -hmm. So I heard that uh, um, they wanted people um, who had experience in uh, construction. Now, the reason why they wanted my husband, other than what I said to you, is because the Bethel family did not know at that time that they had purchased uh, so many buildings that needed remodeling. Bossard Hotel, they had the Standish Hotel, they were remodeling. That's the one my husband went to work on right away. Then they had the Bossard need remodeling. They were built around uh, 1914. So uh, then, then they uh, went on Furman Street, which was a million square feet, and very dilapidated. From World War II, they built tanks in there, army tanks. The elevators in there were humongous. So the Bethel family wasn't enlightened. That's mm -hmm. why they were looking for people like my husband. Yeah. And, uh, so when this began to uh, come out, uh, one day my husband and I were eating supper. Usually we took supper in the, in our room. We, we take leftovers from lunch, but this one evening, uh, for some reason we ate supper with the family. Then you could sit anywhere. Lunch, you could, breakfast and lunch, you had assigned seating in the evening. No. So you sit anywhere. So my husband, we were just finishing and my husband had to go to the bathroom. And so he, he out, he left. So they had the prayer and I was standing there waiting for him. And he came in and he said, you'll never believe who I just saw. And when he told me I was dumbfounded because there was a, he saw a couple, if he hadn't gone out, he would never have seen them. Mm -hmm. but this is a couple that came into Bethel and the woman, I studied with her before I was married, Sarah. went to Palm Beach. And in fact, the experience made it to the yearbook because it was just so unusual. Uh, another uh, witness and I were knocking at the door and they, uh, sh the screen it, the screen door only was there. The main door was open. And so as we were knocking at the door, I saw this woman and she was on her hands and knees and she was backing out the screen door. She was back. Toward. What it was is she had wax, wax in the floor and she was waxing herself out the front door. <laughs> and so I always laugh, you know, you're one of the first people I ever studied with that was backed into me. 
And so <laughs> I had studied with her and uh, uh, before I was married and, I, and she started coming to the Kingdom Hall, she was doing very well. Her husband was a drug addict and she had a little boy that had uh, was born with disabilities. And somewhere along the line, she said um, she was she was leaving West Palm. She was going uh, back uh, somewhere up north, and she disappeared. Never heard from her again. That was the woman that my husband saw, That's and her. and it was so amazing. And the man she was with was her husband, and was a newer husband. The other one had uh, killed himself. The drug addict killed himself. So. Uh, the man she was with, well, where she went, when she left us, she went up to upstate New York, a fish gill, where the society now has a, a work. Fish gill is a bigger town near there. She went there. That's right near, I, I think it's IBM. And he was an architect with IBM. And uh, she was helping her aunt run a business a little business and she met him through that business and uh he was not a witness and she wasn't baptized so anyway they fell in love and got married and he converted in he was an elder for years they had built a a a, a trimaran at one point and they were sailing the caribbean for seven or eight years island to island witnessing so they were very active. And so when this building program was going on at Bethel, they invited him in because he was an mm -hmm. architect. So what a reunion. I mean, it was mm -hmm. amazing. All those many, many years later to see them. They stayed at Bethel for four years and uh, until she was ill and they had to leave. But mm -hmm. um, we were all middle-aged anyway. And yeah. uh, a lot of the women, uh, that came in with husbands who were the ones that the, that uh, they wanted. You know, engineers were being brought in. Their wives were pioneers. They hadn't worked a day in their life outside, you know. So uh, a lot of the women had a hard time with Bethel. Right. Okay, so yeah. how did you get into the research department? Well, I said interesting, uh, you know, you should ask that. I mean, <laughs> that's a story. I just give uh, us the short version, not the long version. Short uh, one. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll make it real short. This is when I went. I heard about the construction uh, engineering department needed people with a background. I had a background in uh, a construction. I worked at one point for a um, guy who was building um, a development. I was his accountant. And I did other, he had another uh, type of business and I was in that one too. I had a very, very uh, good understanding of that part of the construction world. So I, at, uh, so the engine, uh, the architect, the, the friend architect, he told me that they were interviewing people. So I put in for an interview. If you, could I come in as an interview? They don't interview people at Bethel, but they wanted professional people. So in this uh, department, the department became a, 150 people. And so they took me right away. And I was there. I did research for them. I was like a s secretary. Then I became a assistant, uh, like administrative assistant to a architect there because the other one had left with his wife. And so then I was doing uh, research for them. I love research, always have. And these buildings were all in historical areas and they had to be re rebuilt or remodeled back to the way they originally looked. So they had to know what they looked like. So I would be in the libraries and uh, I would be at the Long Island Historical Society seeing what information I could get on these ancient buildings and restoring them. So when the opportunity came that they were looking for a researcher for the uh, writing department, I didn't know anything about it. But uh, at one point in engineering, we were working on um, uh, an environmental impact statement for a 30-story building. 
and what happened was that uh, it was zone. I mean, not zoning. Um, the permits that we needed and everything, everything faltered, and the city wouldn't give us approval. And so my little uh, my area, I was in the architectural discipline area of engineering construction. I we had nothing to do until we had another building to work on. So I went to this the building overseer and I said, can you lend me out to another department? I am so bored. I got to do something. So he let me out for a month in the world's worst uh, department. And um, so for uh, all day long, five days a week, I used my right hand and I put I gave a number to every single wire that was all in Bethel. I mean, it was awful. And the room was cold and the machinery in the room was noisy. And so I proved that I could take it, I think. And so when, when the opening came up for this researcher, I didn't know about it, neither did everybody else. But this man that I asked, do you have a job for me? He recommended me. And I asked him later on, I said, thank you very much for the recommendation. And why did you recommend me? And he said, well, you, you did it almost a month in this other place. He said, you did fine there. He said, but you know, I've been an overseer for 40 years doing this, putting people in the position. No one asked me for more work in 40 years. You were the first person to ask me for more work. <laughs> that is a fluke. And um, so, uh, so anyway, they uh, in, interviewed me in, in their writing. And I got the job because of my re research stuff. And, yeah. and my researching uh, for them was extraordinarily fun. I loved every moment of it. I love history. And I found and discovered things they never knew about their own organization. Oh. And, um, <laughs> I, um, I love people, but I'm not into... Um, people oriented gossip stuff i love researching history and people yeah. so it it was a it was a dream of a lifetime to a, a fulfillment to something i've always wanted to do and i actually have never stopped no is that so, so you got to the stage in the watchtower among many things that um you were really known as a poster parent, you and your husband. Say that again. Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So tell us the story about this, which is on the, I'm just trying to find the date. It was August sometime, wasn't it? Right. Uh -huh. Now, this is a letter that your son and daughter-in-law wrote about you and Joe. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to go on to Watchtower Library now, you would not be able to find this article because it's been removed. But well, if you've got the hard copy, then you would have that. So yeah. why did your son write this letter? Uh, they were just married. And uh, mm -hmm. he, he, somebody introduced him to this uh, volunteer uh, young woman who was not permanent, and she was up at Patterson and uh, say someone who knew my son said, you would probably like to meet her. She, she's very much like you. My son was almost 30 years old then. And uh, he was, a, he's a very um, mechanical person like his father. So uh, he was at the, th at the million square foot building in Furman street, that building, uh, all the elevators were either broken and uh, they were a mess. And uh, so he was just, he was in the press room and he worked at the same place in the press room where his father did years before. It was a coincidence. So when they were trying to restore this building, they knew he was mechanical and they put him over there and he had to restore these uh, elevators. And uh, they put him in a class some some um, Westinghouse, I think they had a class. It was only for a few weeks, but he picked it up. And he, some of the elevators were literally uh, torn up because the people that were there lost their jobs when when the building was sold, and so they tore the building up. So uh, he was very much into all of that, and really didn't want to get married. So, but at, by the time he was thirty, I think he was interested. 
So he met her, <laughs> and and he um, uh, that was ninety. Uh, I think it was around nine ninety. Um, no. It's hard to remember sometime all of the 80, 89, uh, yeah, 89, 90. And um, so he wrote the, a, a, a thank you card, to, as they did to us. So uh, I was so taken with what they wrote that I let the Awake editor, who's a very good friend of ours, read that. And he liked it so much, and he thought it was such a good example of um, of success story, so to speak, with yeah. children, that he published it in The Awake. That's the background of that. Mm. A very lovely letter, though. It, Job it, it indicates what you and Joe are really like as parents. Well, we tried, but what we, what we did was uh, in, in truly inculcate Jehovah's Witnesses teaching yeah. into our son's mind from birth. Yeah. And and that is the way he is to this day. So, uh, you know, that's the way he loves the religion more than he loves his parents. But his parents yeah. trained him to do that. Believe it or not, we said no yeah. matter what happens, you know, in this mm -hmm. lifetime, you put Jehovah first. So yeah. he did. Uh, we understand that. Mm. Well, he has two children. Uh, they uh, they were married um, four years at uh, when uh, they left Bethel uh, to have children. They, right. they live in Florida, some, somewhere in Florida. So you were still in Bethel then. When did you actually leave Bethel? Uh, December, of, uh, the last day in December of uh, 92. 92. Mm -hmm. okay. So we've had a couple of questions come through, and if I can find them again. Um, where are we going? Did you ever have a nickname? A nickname? A nickname. Mm. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I was trying to work out who that was from. Mm -hmm. uh, but put in. That was from Claire. Um, and Claire would also like to know when you were in Bethel. Who is that? You, uh, Claire. She'd like to know what's your memorable moment in Bethel? You know, um, you'll have to say that again because I'm not catching it. The sound is not that good, I think. What is your most memorable moment in Bethel? There were so many that it's very difficult. It, if you have two or three days, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with 4,000 people, then there were mm. the people up at the farm. We met them. There were people from our home congregation. There was a doctor in our home congregation in West Palm Beach, and he and his family were invited to Bethel uh, a few years after we were. And so uh, we meet, we had people, our, we know them everywhere. And mm. uh, when you when you know people you're everybody's got uh an interesting story to tell and i'm sure there were people there that um were not especially interested in me or my story or whatever but uh i always liked it and when i was in i, I liked the people's stories and um so there were so many memorable things of course the thing that i talk about the most these past 28 years is when I found out about child abuse because it changed my whole reason for living. And, yeah. But before that, uh, we had wonderful uh, experiences out in service and, and uh, with, with those that I, I met from across the, from Europe. We traveled, uh, we went to uh, England twice and uh, we went to Turkey. That was a memorable. We went to Ephesus, and uh, we didn't have any money, uh, but you stay at the branch. And uh, at those years, so you'd take advantage of uh, a bar bargains uh, on the airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I think the traveling and meeting other witnesses, because we thought that witnesses were the finest people on the face of this earth. 
mm -hmm. and uh, very uh, like us, sincere people in love with their belief. And so it was, it was always an adventure. Mm -hmm. and, um, I can't say anything else. I had days that, and sometimes that there were things that happened that weren't um, uh, that great. Uh, at one point in my days in the writing department, I had a problem with a, a young woman and uh, she, um, she did everything to get me out of the department. I had, I did not know this. She worked behind the scenes. And when I found out what she was doing and the overseer told me, uh, that uh, she was trying to get my job. She, oh. I, I have things in my office that were important to my uh, research work at um, in engineering, uh, not engineering, I mean writing, and they would disappear. Yeah. And she would go in there in, in my office in the uh, at different times when I was not there, especially after work. And um, it, that was not a very good experience but i did find out later they they left bethel she was uh, in her late 20s and she had a very nice husband who was in a treasury a treasury department mm -hmm. she had been called in from a job she had at watchtower that uh she did very well she's very very pretty and she made the cover the best especially the back cover of the awake a lot and maybe the wash chair once in a while. So, uh, so she was so good at her job when they were writing, uh, compiling and writing the insight books, the two insight books, they invited her in. They had 50 people they invited in to from Bethel, not from outside, from within Bethel. They brought them in from without from the jobs they were doing they worked for maybe a year at the, mm -hmm. on this book and then they go back to where they were so she was so good at her job that they kept her in writing and she did many miscellaneous things and so uh, um but when she found this is what i was telling when she found out that um i was coming in for the research job uh, that was the problem she wanted that job and that's what the overseer told me. Now, our overseer at, at uh, writing department, of course, the one who was over the whole writing department, art and graphics, was Lloyd Berry, governing body member. And his assistant was uh, Jack Barr. But this was uh, over my, my uh, area. And what I was doing, he was writing and compiling the Proclaimers book. And that's uh, Carl Adams. And... Uh, you know, the three Adams brothers from the late forties, they were a fixture at Bethel and very intelligent. And so, uh, in fact, Don Adams was the president of the Watchtower Bottle Track, the corporation for years. So, uh, Joel Adams was a uh, chairman in the right uh, service department of their committee. Uh, and Carl was, uh, he was, at Ray Fran, when Ray Fran was with there, Carl was the manager of the writing department. So, um, so he was extraordinary man to work with, very intelligent. And um, so he told me the circumstances. He told me she wanted my job, and when it when everything, uh, I found out everything. So that's not pleasant. But you know what? They were human. And I was human. And and so there I was in love with what the Bible said. I I um believed it with everything of my being. Mm -hmm. And I always thought this other stuff where people don't get along or there's issues, I call that people junk. And we would not be that way in the new world. But uh even though you I got my feelings hurt here once in a while or there were issues. I could get over that, uh, but I didn't uh, ever dream I would get over their belief system. Yeah. So, uh, but it was child abuse that's the reason I left the organization, not because of their belief system. Mm -hmm. I, um, I idealized the belief system. And, uh, until I began to do research. Here's a researcher that never did research <laughs> yeah. on something that 
my whole life was built on. Mm. So, so, but it, the question can't be answered like it was asked. Memorable, memorable when Joe and I and our son were uh, part of family night. Every six months at Bethel, they had a family night. And uh, it was on Wednesday night, Friday night, and no, Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday night, or Saturday night and Sunday night. I can't remember. It was three nights. And uh, the the slot that we filled, I think was a, well, I, we were on it for when, those three nights because the family was so big, they they could, they'd have to do it in shifts. So, um, so the, we gave our experience, but the, there's a 20, there was a 20 minute slot was always filled by ex circuit overseers and their wives or district overseers and their wives who were at Bethel. They, invited Joe and I and Lance to take that slot. And uh, we gave our experiences. It's, uh, I had the actual video of it because the man who was in communications that videotaped all of that, he gave it to me as a gift. Mm -hmm. I usually don't do that, but he gave it to me as a gift because I, he was a, a, a young man that loved to do historical research. And he did research on a somebody who was involved with the uh, Russell, and nobody really knew much about this man. And this young guy, he did research. It actually came out in the George stores, and he came out with the article in the Awake. They put it in the Awake, but I was the one that uh, recommended that he his, that they look at his article. And they did, and they liked it so much that they published it. Well, when I, you know, when I was in the on that um, family night program, uh, when he re they always recorded everybody, but they don't give him a, th a something like that. And he did it because of of what I did. So uh, eventually, that video made its way to my website, and it's still on my website. But my website's down because of technical problems that we have had and uh, it should be up at the end of this month. But it's there. And that was a night to remember. The three of us telling about our lives. My husband is quite humorous. He's a Johnny Carson type person. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, and our son is also humorous. And so uh, we had a, a lot of laughs during that, too. Yeah, but yeah. The thing about this, why they were so interested in us, is we were an ex example. People, uh, young men who would get married in the future. We were an example of a success story in this organization. And I'm not like chief enemy of this organization, but I was. <laughs> we were the success story. We brought into the organization over 80 people, and that was like, oh how. But you know, it was easy. It was our the way we lived in West Palm Beach and the kind of people we met door to door, it was easy. It's not like today, you know, and the, um, so, so that, those is, that was a very memorable experience. If I want to look at my, how I looked all those many, many years ago, I can just go on my website and normally look at this experience. So, um, the, there's just too, too many. I think the, the m most memorable of my whole life is when we were in the car pulling away from Bethel, coming back to Tennessee. I'll never forget that. It was with a sigh of relief. It was a sigh of relief. I knew all about the child abuse problems and I couldn't, I couldn't stay there anymore. I couldn't come. I couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was, what I knew to be so. And, um, and I also uh, was assigned by the Awake editor to write uh, on child abuse and put a package together of inf information to prove to the governing body that they had a serious problem internationally. And I did that. And I knew because I knew these governing body members. Uh, some of them we associated with personally. You know, we went places, did things. And, but the one that I knew that I was very aware that he was problematic, if he found out that I had done this, put this together, I knew he would figure out how to have me disfellowshipped. 
So yeah. I said, I got to get out of here because nobody will believe my story if I'm just fellowship. Mm, that's right. So I think that was a that was a conclusion to a lifetime of service. And when I came back to here, I was actually f uh, f almost four years doing research and also uh, on articles for writers uh, four more years uh, for my for my house. But still, primarily, it was child abuse research and talking to victims. And they weren't going to change their policies. And I couldn't conscientiously stay and support any anybody, any organization that wouldn't make it safe for children. So that was a conscious choice that you made. Uh, you got out of Watchtower because of what you discovered. You made the choice for the last 28 years to expose and educate. What are some of the other things that you've been able to do that um, now when you look back at it, you realise that have been really good? For example, like this one here. Tell us a little bit about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, when I... Um this is this, this is something I don't usually don't talk about because I'm really ashamed of it and that's not that article but it's what I did when I was 16 years old okay I was 16 years old and moved to Miami I didn't go back to school so I didn't get uh, my uh, diploma I did go to uh, take classes and I by that time I already could type and I already uh, uh, could do a uh, minimum amount of bookkeeping. So I went and took classes, and uh, but I never got my diploma. And I always was shamed at that. But I did it because Armageddon was coming. See, hmm. and the people that studied with me were both pioneers. And I, and I knew why, I'm, you know, any moment Armageddon's coming, where I go back to school. So when I left the organization, I went to the nearby college and took my uh, GED test to get a diploma, high, sc high school diploma. And when I did that, uh, because my grades were okay, they gave me a uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I got a two year scholarship and all the books paid for everything to the college. Yeah. Why I'm telling you, even though I was out of the witnesses in that, Nobody knew that I was out. Out. I wasn't this fellowship. I didn't. I hadn't have uh, uh, told anybody I was out. They just thought I still was busy working for the society because a lot of times I didn't meet, go to meetings because I was busy. And um, so, so uh, I was um, scared to death. I go to college. I go to the college grounds. Well, this is something I preached against all these years. And here I am uh, with the worldly people. <laughs> and so it was very difficult on me until I got used to it and I loved it. And so we were um, in the first, um, uh, it was in, it was, uh, okay, English 101. And uh, that's, the, so that's like when you're in high school, as soon as you go to the first year of college, you get you got to take that course. And so the professor asked us to write an essay, and and uh, I wrote this in college, and he um, he made me stand up when he gave back our our papers and the grades. He made me stand up, and he said, "This is one of the best essays I have ever read." And he said, "Could I put it in my book?" Because I, he said, I have a book I keep and I use it for every every new class and you know I I give them um, an idea of how to write an essay, and so um, he wrote all over the paper even what he thought of this, and I had to read it. Now let me tell you, you might think I I felt wonderful about this. No, all of those years I was a witness, I I thought. Um, Every, Jehovah was first. Everything about my life was Jehovah and the organization. Commendation is not something that Jehovah's Witnesses are used to. I was so embarrassed and so horrified that I was being commended and standing up there being commended because we're all, con con Jehovah's Witnesses, 
get used to being con condemnation. You never do enough. You know, it's a performance religion. You stop performing, you, that's it. You're going to die, right? <laughs> so yeah. they're making a big deal out of this. And uh, I had to learn to take a compliment because I didn't mm -hmm. think I was worth anything. That's yeah. the problem with the witnesses. And it's a shame that we we did it. We did it to our own, our own studies. We did it. And so... Um, so years and years have passed, and I had a folder with had all of my um, college work. And in the newspaper, they had a new editor. We have a very fine newspaper here for, uh, well, this is a town of 20,000, but have two towns plus the county. We have over 60,000 in this county. And they're engineers, and they're, we have support, uh, big support um, businesses for the for uh, uh, automobile plants, everything. And so uh, it's a good newspaper. So anyway, I got a new editor and uh, he, he has actually published many books himself before he came here. So he put in the paper, he said he's gonna start Writer's Corner if anybody would like to submit a uh, something and he told how many words or whatever. And so I decided to submit it. And um, so, the, fir the, the first announcement was with a, uh, a, uh, somebody had given him that yeah. went in. I submitted mine and it went in. So it was the second writer's corner. And, um, you know, I did that a long time ago, but college gave me back self esteem or gave me self esteem. And um, the organization also did me a favor. It taught me how to feel comfortable with people. Mm -hmm. it, it taught me how to speak. It taught me many things that I'm grateful for that I would have never been like had I not been a witness. And I used those and I built my skills on my past. And so I have certain regrets, but on the other hand, I don't have regrets. I have, of course, I have regrets that my, about my son and his wife and children that we don't know. But uh, you can't have everything in life, and and um, it, it, all I say is it's an adventure. And I say to people who call and talk to me about my life, who are very sad about their lives, and I say, listen. You know, I put one foot in front of the other, no matter what the situation was like. Yep. But I said, I always went around the corner. That's where you don't know what's waiting for you. That's where the adventure is. So keep walking. And I'll tell you another thing I have learned. Be a volunteer. Jehovah's Witnesses, we volunteered. We, we volunteered everything. We uh, your whole waking and and sleeping existence is about the way of life, Jehovah's Witnesses. But outside of that, there's a world of people taking care of others, helping others. And I want to tell you, there are adventures there. And I have done that too, and met wonderful people. Some of the best, uh, most honest people are in volunteer organizations because they want to help others. And so I um, volunteered for the Red Cross, which the Watchtower is against, you know, you don't, it's a Red Cross. It was the adventure I had with that one. And I should write a book on that adventure. The kind of people I met, the things that, that uh, I, I did. Uh, so, you are what you are. You build on what you are. Yeah, we got regrets. Especially if you're born a witness and all the choices have been taken away from you because like we did to our son, you got to do this, you know, whatever. And I wasn't like that. Uh, uh, I had a, a, I was Catholic. I, we celebrated Christmas. We did all those things when I was uh, 14 years old. So I... I've had, um, you know, I've just had so many visions that other people might not ha have, but they're out there. 
they're out there you just gotta look for them and you know it, we were so anxious to help other people live forever uh why can't we be anxious to help people that's right yeah and and we know how to talk <laughs> we know how to be nice right you know that's as a witness you 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 had to be nice keep putting up with one another right that's a, for the vital so we did that we need we have skills mm -hmm. and we use them and we develop them and we're happy we're happy because we're free i think that's, that's the true. best thing I, one time i was in italy and mm -hmm. um i spoke at the vatican it was arranged for me this is after i left uh 2009 and uh it was a, a huge church on the mediterranean that was made arrangements for me to talk at and so afterwards oh the, it was big response because the witnesses in italy are the second biggest or largest religion and they were so they're very competitive with the church you know and the, the catholic church just does not like them of course and so you don't know to the extent what the Catholic Church does to try to get rid of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's very interesting. So anyway, so I was speaking, and then I had a translator, an ex-witness, 30 years an elder in Europe, mm -hmm. who spoke at, he spoke five languages, so he would be, be an inter interpreter at conventions. So anyway, he was interpreting and after it was over, people lined up to talk to me. Well, I didn't speak Italian. So there's a woman who tears were rolling out her eyes when she came up to me. And a, presumably it was her husband standing behind, I don't know. But she said, and he, my interpreter said she was just disfellowshipped. She uh, did complained about something and they apostasy. Okay. So I, I leaned up, uh, over, over her shoulder and hugged her and i said i didn't know my i don't know anything about italian and i said um libertaire something like that libertaire and and so uh the interpreter robbie he said a few more words and what i was telling her was don't cry and i wiped her tears and i said you're free and and so he added some words well five years ago i got a um on my facebook page i got a message and it was her nice. all these years she wrote me she said thank you she said um you were right and she said i took your advice and she said freedom is wonderful so yeah you got to look at the positive. You don't look at the negative. Mm -hmm. And there's so much waiting for you. Right now, this COVID is a mess. And maybe in the United States, we've got political problems that are a mess. But there's still things you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my experience is, let me tell you, it costs you about three dollars to get on the subway, I think, or something in New York. I said my my experiences and three bucks will get you on the subway. You know, I said, I'm nobody. Absolutely, all I am is an information pusher longer. <laughs> so I'm a great one. Well, I know how to talk. <laughs> And believe it or not, I don't talk all the time because everything I, I know my husband already knows. So we're silent most of the time <laughs> except for uh, the daily things of living. But but I have a wealth of experience. And one of the major reasons that I've caused such a problem with the wash chair is that they just fellowship the wrong person. What a shame. Yeah, me. <laughs> because when I was a witness... I would have given my life for it. And yeah. I ain't a witness and I'll give my life the other way. Because yeah. that's my personality. Yeah. That's all it is. It's a personality thing. And and um but I can share with others and that that there are givens in the world. 
you know, it's a given. It is. Like what says in the Bible that it's better to give than to receive. Now, I'm not pushing the Bible. These are givens of history. People mm -hmm. have observed that, you know? So uh, it works. And uh, give of yourself, but you don't have to be a monk. No. <laughs> Definitely not. Well, Barbara, it's been so lovely to be able to chat with you today. Thank you. Just had, a, just had a comment come in, and Claire would like to um, send you that <laughs> message. You're right. But more importantly, Claire would like to tell you that. Thank you. I hope so. Let me tell you, could I add one little story? A little one. By all means. By all, all right. means. This is not a good story. It's a half good story or a little good story. Okay. My mom was 91 when she died in 2006. Mm. She got to the point where uh, uh, she couldn't walk anymore. And, um, and then she had a blood disease. So in the hospital, when we, when we took her to the hospital, she only lasted five days. Mm. So... She's my mother was Polish, by the way, from Poland, and she came into this country was 15. Uh, that's what that story's about that was put in the newspaper about my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, she had wisdom. She used to say to me, uh, when I complained on anything, she'd say, It could be worse, you know, she never would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was always, it could be worse. So I never had any satisfaction. <laughs> she said, to me, you, you, you make your bed, you sleep in it. I said, you know, I heard that a million times growing up. Before she died, two, two or three years before she died, I said, what does that mean? She says, in Poland, uh, we had nothing. And uh, this is, uh, she's born in 1915. So it's World War I. And she said, um, we had straw straw mats, that's our beds. Mm -hmm. And so she said, the straw, you when you got up in the morning was flat. And so you padded it, put air in it, everything. Yeah. When you're so tired at night because of all the work, all the kids had to work, you didn't eat. So she said, you fell into bed. If you didn't fluff it all up, you'd hit the ground. That's <laughs> yeah. what it means. It became part of my life. Yeah. You make your bed, you sleep in it. You make yeah. bad mistakes. You selfish. You this. You you're the one that suffers. You can't blame other people under certain circumstances. Now, in child abuse and all of that, another story. We're turning in, in making decisions. Make good decisions. And so, being positive is a great addition to life. Yes. That is from your friend Karen, who's married to Roger. I'm Karen. Yes, she she knows all my experiences. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely couple. <laughs> One day I would like to meet Karen and Roger and you and Joe. Yeah. Joe's going well, that is. That so just, just um, you've had all these adventures in your life. What would be one of the next adventures that you'd like to have? That's a good question, but I didn't. I got to add that to the other one. I, what, oh, okay, oh, sorry. Okay, but my mom, when she was dying, she said that the doctor told her there was no solution. She she's too old, and they would uh, do, uh, do a transplant of whatever. And so she said that's okay. She had a very pretty accent because she came in this country at fifteen. She didn't wasn't a very heavy uh, Polish accent. And she said, that's okay. She said, I'm not useful anymore. And she said, that's why I will go to rest. She said, but I'm, um, I'm sorry that I won't be here to see what you're accomplishing, Barbara, but I'm not useful. The doctor was standing with me by the bed and he was crying. Tears were running down his face. Mm. And she she gave me my motto in life. I was useful over the years. I never thought about it. I said I did what was right, but I never thought of useful. So now I think of useful. So I think that's the best thing 
for all of us to yeah. have that kind of, of attitude like she had. Be useful, mm. and then you'll be happy. So yeah. I concluded that. Now, what was the other question? <laughs> what would you like as an adventure, say, in the next 12 months, what would your next adventure like to be? I'd like, I do, we've done, we, we analyze this. Believe it or not, my husband does talk. You know, I like. Oh, does he? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he's a clever. <laughs> and so we talk. And with COVID, everything's changed. We don't go out. We, you know, we stick to home. We have a lot to do at the here. And um, I have all my adventures with talking to uh, attorneys, you know, lawyers and people who call and helping out and being useful. So I'm busy. And as far as traveling, I don't know. I mean, we, before this, we would go to Florida, which is, you know, it's like second home. And we'd love to go visit friends that we have in Puerto Rico who have a fabulous history. They were people that uh, knew Ray Franz and were just fellowship with the Franzes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, you know, um, Ray Franz way back when. And I'd love to go see them. Uh, but, um, it, it, we don't have any longing to go. You know, we have people who say, come visit us and, and stay with us, you know, wh whatever. Um, I, I started a book uh, years and years ago on the Russells. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that's why I didn't continue college. I, I fulfilled my uh, scholarship agreement. And rather than I decided to uh, do some investigating on things that bothered me about the Russells. Yep. And um, so I decided that I would look into that, uh, their life. And I did for over two years. I hired a re professional researcher in um, Pittsburgh and uh, paid him, took a part time job. And uh, my husband was still an elder. You know, I was out. He didn't go out for almost four years. That was uh, interesting. And so I was, he was living with an unbeliever. And I asked him afterwards, I said, when he left, I said, hey, did you ever think about divorcing me because we had nothing in common? He said, no, no, it never entered my mind. He said, we had, at that time, he, he said, we had so many years together. We had so, I, he said, I have so many memories. Well, why would I give you up when I had all these memories? Why would I divorce you? Because of a religion? <laughs> <laughs> shocked me but see he was already out he had been reading everything when he after he got out he he started reading and uh, he left over how they treated me but he was also talking to me the last year and if i was to tell you you'll laugh but i'll tell you anyway i said to him because i didn't know the last year that he was in that he really was out in his heart he did not right. tell me Yep. And he was just watching and listening. See, he's the one who came home from the meeting as an elder and said, oh, the elders want to meet with you, you know, at Friday at 4 o'clock. You know. He was in, and he was listening to all the stuff and he would see the lies and he would he would um, defend different issues, you know. So um, he he said, to, I said, well, how could you be a year out and not? And me not knowing, you know, in your heart. So I said, now listen, I hope I don't stumble anyone. But he said, well, you don't know this, but he said, there were people that were talking about you and people who were, I thought, you know, make, make trouble for you and so forth. He said, I was covering your ass. What do you know what he meant? Internationally, you know what that means. He <laughs> was protecting me. And yeah. my husband does not curse, never. In fact, he forbid me to say even jackass all the years I was married. So I thought, boy, you have really come down. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we both have, uh, we love life. Yeah. And, and we both love to laugh. Yeah. And we have similar interests. And so I think if I could get another 10 years and finish my book, even mm -hmm. though I know in 10 years 
nobody's even going to think about Jehovah's Witnesses because without the house task work, you got a 10 year old kid today. Yeah. 10 years. They never heard of them because there's no Joe's Witness calling at the door and they're not going to go back to that. If you think that they are, I don't think so. <laughs> but you'll see. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I don't think so because I have some, it's, I hear things. Okay. okay. So uh, this is going to be an, I said this five years ago. I put it in print. It's an e religion, electronic religion. And I got to stay electronic religion because they're selling too many lawsuits in the, every day because of liability, because of elders, and because of uh, hands on control, right? And that can lead to liability. And that's extraordinary what they got themselves into because they got too much into people's private life and now and they told them what to do they made the decisions on what to do in crime how to handle crime yeah and they was wrong decisions do i think that they were evil maybe some i think i think jairus was evil uh governing body member but i think most of them are stupid just yeah. stupid and they don't listen and they're stupid because of arrogance over belief. And I'm not saying belief is wrong. There are two things that we have always been taught here in the United States. If you don't want to get into a fight with people, don't discuss religion or politics. Why? Okay. <laughs> Why? Religion and politics are both beliefs. Belief. Who you vote for, your, your belief. Religion, belief. People kill for belief and makes you arrogant. And yeah. so, consequently, this watch, this group from the very beginning have increased in A, where the God's people and so forth. And um, they had all the reasons to cover up abuse, which uh, people do. 91% of people do not report child abuse everywhere. They don't because they don't want to bring uh, uh, disgrace on the family. The same as what Watchtower did want to bring disgrace. The Bo Boy Scouts in America didn't want to bring disgrace, right? They don't want to bring disgrace and talk about the problem with child abuse. If they do something first, then they wouldn't be disgraced. They'd be heralded as wonderful people. Turn them over to the authorities. That's not a disgrace. Mm -hmm. Pedophiles try to get in everywhere. They're the smarties. They know how to do it. Then you catch them, and then they don't molest the second the second child. But if you don't turn them over, they keep on going. Watchtower made a terrible error in their in that arrogance of, oh, we don't want to bring reproach on Jehovah's organization. What foolishness! They brought such reproach on their organization. They had to turn it into an e-religion. Mm -hmm. And nobody cares about them. Nobody. The fastest growing religion in the world in the 80s and early 90s is the fastest decreasing religion in all the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Well, just, thank you very much, Barbara. We certainly have appreciated your talk. You are very well. I enjoyed it. I don't talk about my past too much. And so the, it was nice to do it. If you can stand listening, learn. Uh, it was really great. All right. Just one more message, if you can, please. Mm -hmm. Pass on to Joe this <laughs> message. Yeah, all right. I will give your love to Joe. He is an amazing man because he stayed married to me. If I tell you how old I, or how long we're married, you'll know that I am really, really up in age. But I got to tell you, I'm married at three. <laughs> okay. I dated an older man at three. He was five. Okay. Ooh. Married shortly thereafter. And you know what? It was a, it was a very rom a romantic and wonderful to date an older man. This is a <laughs> joke now. This is my joke. I get tell everybody over the years, but I said, you know what? Now it's a drag. <laughs> <laughs> we are married. 61 years in last November. Nice. And, and um, it is just sad that um, that we don't have our son. But you know what? He made his choices yeah. and, uh, and we made ours. 
Yeah. And every, I believe in freedom of choice. And I also believe in freedom of religion, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think that people have a right to, to believe that you can't harm. That's the whole deal here. You, can, yeah. you have a belief you can't harm. And the political beliefs are causing people to harm. Religious beliefs cause people to, not all of them, not all of them, you know, but you know that. Where I'm, where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. So uh, just take the advice. I'm going to be gone from this earth. All I have is advice. And I got I got nobody else to give it to. I might as well give it to you all. Well, thank you. We certainly have appreciated. And for those who have been on our live stream today and putting through the comments and the questions, we've appreciated it. It's helped. Um, you all have a share. We appreciate you being here to join myself and our special guest, Barbara, who's had adventures. But did you notice she's unhappy? Not a chance. So if you're finding that even in your life now that you're struggling, that it seems to be so hard, remember, in our group, we do have something that will help us to be able to take steps forward, putting those negative thoughts beside and behind us so that we can move this way. What is that? Well, let's conclude this live stream with a video that deals on our Dare to Dream private group. If you really, really need the help, we have some amazing life coaches and therapists there that are willing to be at your side and support you thanks once again for being here we look forward to seeing you in the next one thanks for coming and keep safe thank you life after jehovah's witnesses what are we going to do what can you do is it really possible that you can dare to dream how can we do that Regardless of who you are, each one of us who has left a high control group will go through the stages that all survivors go through. Some move through a little faster than others. You see, when we lose something, we can get hurt whether from family or our thinking. We may be in denial or speechless at the shock of it all. What is it all about when we get numb? It may be a roller coaster of emotion when you least expect it. We might search through our life and get angry at what's happened, or feel afraid when things happen in the world because we were taught to think that way. And as we go down this journey, we may get lonely. We might panic about things that they've taught us for so many years and then when we finally do something for ourselves, we feel guilty. Through this journey of highs and lows, we need to make some adjustments. Yes, we might get depressed. We might get upset. We might feel that we don't fit in anywhere. The new relationships that we have with a romantic or an everyday life shows us the strength that was there all along. The patterns that we formed in our lives are now gone. We have the power within. We are free to create new patterns that give us hope, gives us a chance to finally help ourselves. To move on. To enjoy the freedom we now have and live the life we deserve. Will you dare to dream? But the question remains, how? You have the freedom. You can have a guilt-free life. It's all there for you to have. So you can dare to dream. Life holds special magic for those who dare to dream.